Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Jason. Um, I'm going to try to keep my energy up for this talk. Uh, I usually do when I speak, uh, but I have a little bit of a situation going on right home, uh, right now at home. My wife's in the ER. Uh, my kids are watching my other kids, and I've done four talks this week already. So I'm going to try to keep it up, but if I'm a little bit less than super, super Jason Haddix, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm going to do my best. So this talk I've wanted to do for a long time. It's called The Dark Side of Bug Bounty. And it is a collection of notes around the kind of worst possible scenarios that can happen in bug bounty programs. So we did a little survey originally about like what you guys do, but there are four primary types of people, or three primary types of people uh, in the equation of bug bounty. So there are bug bounty hunters, people who find vulnerabilities. How many bug bounty hunters do we have in here? Okay, good amount. There are uh, program owners, so they work at the company that runs the bug bounty program. Who, who are those people in the audience? You could be triage, you could be program management, you could be vulnerability management, stuff like that. And then you have people that work on the platform that do the triage, or the platform people in here, like uh, Bug Crowd, Synac, HackerOne, Integrity, things like that. Do we have any of those people in here? You wouldn't raise your hand. You wouldn't want to raise your hand for this one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so why am I uniquely situated to give this talk? Um, because I've been on all sides of the equation. So um, I am ranked number 57th overall on Bug Crowd as a hacker. Um, I have been hacking on Bug Crowd for a long, long time. Um, recently, I've started to build up my rep on integrity as well. I've done HackerOne live events. I've done Bug Crowd live events. Um, I'm pretty much well versed in the hacker area of uh, bug bounties. I have also been on the platform side. I worked at Bug Crowd for six years, um, four of them as uh, the head of operations, meaning I managed the triage team globally. Um, so that means I got to see every bug bounty program that they ran. Um, through my tenure, I saw tens of thousands of bugs uh, filter through the queue at Bug Crowd and managed my teams to triage them. Um, I have also known triagers that have gone to other platforms and stay in touch with them. So some of this stuff is not my direct experience. It's notes from other people on other platforms. I don't mention any platforms in this. I think that platforms, all the platforms have a lot of the same problems that I'm going to talk about in these slides. Um, and then I've also been a program owner. I've run a multinational company as a CISO, and so I had to purchase Bug Bounty as a part of a security program, as part of a vulnerability management program and assessment program. And so we had to build a scope and deal with you know, running a program just like everybody else does. And so I've got to see this ecosystem grow from its infancy to its adulthood uh, and got to see every skeleton in the closet, basically. So we're going to talk about some of the notes I have. They're a little bit scattered, but hopefully they're fun to talk about. The first thing we're going to talk about is some of the really crappy things that are going on right now in the bug bounty industry in general. Um, and this is kind of uh, goes back to a thing that me and my uh, friend talk about is that um, a lot of people uh, have pivoted from celebrating the creativity of the bug bounty hunters who are uh, submitting really cool vulnerabilities and scaling your security program in a way that you really couldn't do before. You had to really consult with pen testers and stuff like that before. Um, now they're starting to exploit them a little bit. And so we're going to talk about two things that I think are kind of shitty in that way. You guys don't mind if I drop a curse word every once in a while, right? You're okay? All right. <laughs> all right. So the first thing I'll talk about is AI. So right now, at all of the platforms, um, what they're doing is they're taking bug bounty hunters attack traffic. And they're training AI models on this attack traffic. And what they're doing is they're building services out of it. They're building threat intel feeds for program owners to understand what type of attacks exist in hardware hacking, web hacking, all kinds of different hackings. And then they're also building vulnerability scanners um, out of training off of these models in this attack traffic. Uh, and what's happening is that they're basically stealing attack data and research data from researchers, and they give no payments to the bug hunters for this. We get nothing for it, basically. So um, for instance, I find a zero day tomorrow on SAP or something like that, and I submit it to a bug bounty platform. They will automatically train on it with the attack string I used, and then they'll either turn it into a threat feed or a scanner, uh, give the benefit to all of their customers, but never give me any kickback on that vulnerability. So I only get paid once, and maybe they found hundreds of thousands of instances of that vulnerability. So this is a really shitty part of the industry, and I'm hoping that this changes. I'm hoping that we can move towards a model um, where if, that happened, and I didn't have access to a program 
uh, where I couldn't submit that SAP vulnerability, that they would automatically be able to tell me and say, hey, we did locate this on 35 other customers. Here's a 20% kickback, right? Because it was your vulnerability research. So um, this is how I'm hoping this changes, but right now there's no indication that that's gonna happen and they will continue stealing uh, from bug hunters. Another one is cloud WAFs. Um, so in the industry, obviously you have companies that are uh, cloud-based web application firewalls uh, or cloud-based protection suites. Um, these products are ubiquitous to every application these days and all of your internet connected infrastructure. These are things like Akamai and Cloudflare and um, you know, like some of the other firewall vendors have these type of things. Um, so a couple weeks ago, a friend of mine was streaming and um, he's streaming on Twitch and he's streaming hacking stuff. And, um, and we're talking in Twitch chat because we all like to support each other and he's like a content creator slash streamer. And we get to talking and um, we're talking about a new AI tool that we're gonna build. And live in chat, a representative from um, one of these companies um, basically says, oh, that's really cool. I'm gonna build a defense against that and take it. So then we end up talking to a whole bunch of researchers around um, kind of around the scene. And um, we compare some notes and some conversations we've had. Um, and it turns out that there's a lot of kind of nefarious stuff going on. So when you're a bug bounty hunter and you submit attack traffic, um, sometimes the platforms ask you to put a web header in there so they can recognize it to you. Um, now, anybody between your home machine and the client you're attacking and the bug bounty hunting uh, company when you submit the report can identify you by that header. It's a unique header. Um, it's usually like hacker one something or whatever, you know. Um, now, what we didn't know until very recently is that uh, Akamai, Cloudflare, companies like this, do any of you work for Akamai or Cloudflare? Okay. Um, they're monitoring about a list of 250 of the best bug bounty hunters in the world. They're monitoring our traffic, our attack patterns, what we're doing, and they're trying to build just-in-time protections for the type of attacks we're doing and sell it as part of their rule set. Um, without giving us any credit. Um, they're also sending representatives to watch our streams, um, monitor our GitHub commits, go to our talks, that's why I asked if anybody was in here, um, and monitor our chats um, on the uh, open bug bounty discords and slacks. Then they take this data and they share it with each other. Um, so they have agreements with each other to share attack data so that they can do analytics on it. And in some of the worst cases we've had, Bug bounty hunters have released tools that were really, really good tools in the offensive security space. And these vendors have gone out and strong armed young impressionable researchers and forced them to take these tools offline or at least pressured them to do so. Um, so this is the kind of stuff we deal with. Now the solutions here are just better communication and a technical solution to bug bounty hunting. I'm a big believer that um, you know, that's top 250 people that they feel like they need to monitor for that kind of stuff. Um, first of all, they just get in our way. They're security by obscurity. It doesn't take me long to bypass one of those cloud-based WAFs. It's just kind of an annoyance. But I don't feel good about the, re about the data sharing between companies. Um, and so if they want to just put some research time rather into doing all this against us and just make a global header that allows a background-checked bug bounty researcher who is well-known in the community, to bypass all this stuff and they don't have to monitor and I'll just work with them. I'd much rather have a community that worked like that than one that works like this. Okay, let's talk about triage in bug bounty. Okay, so if you've ever run a bug bounty, um, how budget works in a bug bounty is, and how you purchase a bug bounty is usually, you go into the bug bounty platform and you're like, hey, I want to negotiate, I want to buy bug bounty. And what you're buying when you buy bug bounty is you're buying the platform to ingest the bugs usually. And then you're buying maybe triage associated to that. You're getting a triage from the platform. And then you're also paying uh, your, reward, your reward pool in the, for, in, the, in the initial payment. And so it's usually structured as a one-year deal or a three-year deal. Um, you get a price break if you go for a three-year deal with the platforms. Now, the reason that... Um, you pay for all of these things in one lump sum is, is usually because it's you're trying to skirt your finance, your finance group at your company, right? So it's a financial, um, 
Like it is a financial trap to pay bug bounty hunters out um, from your company. It requires a whole bunch of tax paperwork for each bug, bug that you pay out individually. This is why people use the platforms a lot. Um, so what you do is you pay for the platform, you pay for the triage, and then you pay for your first year of bug bounty rewards all as one lump sum to the platform. And then they hold an escrow, uh, the money for the payouts to the hackers. Um, and so that's called the reward pool. Um, and that way, it's just one lump sum that your finance team sees, and you don't have to do the taxes. Bug Crowd has to do the taxes, or Hacker One has to do the, hack, uh, the taxes for each bug payout, which is a tremendous benefit to you know, your financial teams. Um, and so that's kind of how budgeting works and how payment works for a program. Now, a very common situation in the worst part of bug bounty is that um, you start a bug bounty and you haven't had enough security testing yet, uh, or you just didn't know that you had a whole bunch of assets out there, or, or you know, you just miss kind of judged how bad you were going to get crushed by the bug bounty hunters. Um, and this happens so often. Um, so you open a public program and you get hundreds of submissions, like hundreds, like 800 to maybe even 1,000, 1,200. I've seen programs... I saw a program once get 8,000 submissions in a week uh, from the bug bounty hunter community. Now, obviously, your triagers at the platform are there to lessen that load, but it's still a lot of load on your team. And you've made a contract, and you've opened a program, and all these bugs come rushing in at once, immediately your scope, uh, or immediately your budget, it gets exhausted. Like, it's, it's gone within a day. Like, a lot of people grossly underestimate how much it's going to take to run a public bug bounty. A lot of people go in thinking, I'm gonna spend you know, the first year maybe 80K uh, on bug bounty payouts. The reality is if you have a large scope program, you're gonna spend somewhere between 300 to 500K. Um, if you keep it open and you don't pause it and you don't do some of the shitty things I'm about to tell you that some people do. So what happens in this situation with the worst customers is they get really scared about the bug bounty and their budget getting exhausted and they get really conservative with payouts. Um, and so what they do is they take the contextual ratings of uh, CVSS, which most of the platforms use to rate the impact of a bug, and they start downgrading little edge cases out of them. I'll highlight the specific ones that they downgrade. Um, but the customers will downgrade these to make the bug fall to a lower payout level so that they can have more remaining budget on the other side. The other way that they try to protect against budget exhaustion when they get crushed by a bug bounty um, program is they try to group bugs together. So instead of individually paying out every XSS that they find, they'll be like, oh, we're just going to pay out the first few and we're going to say that holistically XSS is a problem and we're not going to pay out XSS anymore. And they're going to say, oh, yeah, it's because of it's because of a framework level problem. And once we fix the framework level problem, all XSS will be fixed, which is a bunch of bullshit. Um, but they do this very often, uh, sometimes even at the suggestion of the platforms, which is kind of nefarious. So in triage, clients get in the loop uh, with the triage after the platform does. So the platform triager usually helps rewrite the bug, um, decide if the bug is valid, and then passes it on to the customer. Um, when customers get in the loop, uh, it, stuff can get like real crazy. So if a customer is not uh, technical enough, just on accident, they can mess up the scoring of the impact of a vulnerability. And most often, either the, the nefarious downgrade of a vulnerability or the accidental downgrade of a vulnerability, sorry about the typo, is in four sections in CVSS4. It's the access requirements, attack requirements, user interaction requirements, and privilege requirements in CVS version 4. These are all dials that you turn on CVSS version 4. And whether you uh, say that you know, access, you need to have network access, or you need to have authenticated access, or something like that, the bug severity goes up and down. Now, a lot of customers make the first mistake just because they don't understand CVSS. They say, oh, like the privilege requirements are that you have to be um, you know, authenticated. Um, and they, they consider that uh, not self-sign up. They consider that like employee level access. And so they think, oh, well, you know, 
they had to register for this self, they had to self register for the site to get access to this function and then hack this site. Um, but when that's free registration, really that's open access, right? Anybody can register for a website, get an account, find a bug. And so uh, they'll do this on accident, they'll, they'll underscore this. So there's several ways that they can do this by accident. Um, there's also this world, and I've seen it many times, where the second level of triage at the client is done by a security engineer at the client site. And, um, you know, they're probably a really good security engineer, but they're jaded because they have 800 submissions in the queue. Um, and so they start rating bugs uh, with a custom rubric that they make themselves. Um, and it is not very data driven. And so um, what they'll do is they'll start triaging based on um, how long it takes to exploit the bug, which shouldn't matter, um, how technical the bug is. Um, sometimes you find really stupid stuff like a website that has a default password um, and that lets a hacker into your systems. But the impact of that is what you should be, which should be the key rating value for that, right? And so if that DevSecOps panel that had a default password on it, got them access to all your customer data or all of your DevSecOps data or all your logs or something, that should be uh, the end all be all way that you triage a bug like that. Um, and then sometimes they lower triage or they, um, or they lower uh, impact by saying that there was mitigating controls behind, um, behind the controls that you bypassed, which there's no way for a bug hunter to verify that. Um, and so a lot of times you get in a lot of arbitration and, um, you know, kind of bad situations between like people are like, oh, well, we would have noticed that in our logs or, you know, we had a mitigating manual check of this process. And so like the bug hunter doesn't know that, like um, they accessed your system, accessed your logs, they had it or they exploited this vulnerability. Um, pretty sure that it counts right for a bug bounty. So. The other one that they can do that uh, really shitty clients can do is they can say there was an existing issue in their backlog, um, which I have seen outright customers lie about. Um, they say, oh yeah, we knew about this issue. It came from our pen testers two years ago. We just haven't had time to fix it. Well, if it was two fucking years ago, like that's bad. Uh, and anyway, like show me proof, right? Like this is a very common one. And again, I'm not saying this is you guys. I'm saying this is the worst of all customers I've ever seen. But there are some shitty customers out there. OK, so another thing uh, shitty customers do is they make payout ranges. And so they'll say, hey, like a critical bug is worth like 20K to us or 50K or 100K if they're going ham. And um, sorry, give me one second. Um, and so they'll make these ranges for payment. They'll say anything between 10 and 40K, depending on what we decide, right? Less than 15% of clients who use ranges, sorry about the typos, I made the slides last night. Uh, less than 15% of clients who use ranges pay anything above the minimum of that range ever. You have some gold star customers who do that, like Google and Meta, and they really have a vulnerability rating board internally in the company. Um, but uh, most of the time they just pay the, the bare minimum. And so setting your expectation that as a career hacker who's gonna do bug bounty, um, you can really get kind of skunked on what you think is uh, gonna be a great program and then you get wrecked. This is very common right now in the Web3 space. So there are, very, there are a lot of Web3 bounties that want to make a splash in the press and say, if you can hack our crypto you know, system, we will give you a million dollars. There's several of these going on right now. And then I've had several bug hunters break into their sites, get all their customer data, have the ability to backdoor their algorithms and basically mess up their whole exchange. But because the bug wasn't a crypto related bug, like a smart contract bug, because it was a web bug, they got paid 20K instead of a million. Um, and so there is some really shady stuff going on like that right now in the industry. And those, those million dollar payouts, they're mostly for marketing. Uh, they're mostly a, a marketing ploy to make the company look like they're more secure. Uh, the only people I've seen out pay million dollar bugs, uh, at least recently, or close to a million dollars, has been uh, T-Mobile has a really forward-facing bug bounty program, and they've paid out really high rewards for bug hunters uh, who did very specific things. 
All right, so some of these same things happen at live events. So if you've never been to a live, how many of you have been to a live event before, a hacker live event? Cool, so some of you, yeah. So if you haven't been, live events at Bug Crowd, Hacker One, Integrity, Let's, uh, Let's Hack, or um, Yes We Hack, um, they're basically giant hacker parties where uh, you fly out a whole bunch of really good, really high scoring, really well known bug, hunt bug hunters to a location um, and they basically focus on a single tar or on a single company, and they increase the reward substantially for this period, um, and they open up new scope. Now, several live events, um, and you'll, you can talk to like a bunch of the bug bounty hunters, but um, several live events have been the most disastrous thing ever, where the client puts in new scope into the program uh, for the live event and says, "Hey, um, you know, we're going to pay 20k." per critical vulnerability. And then in 40 minutes, they get 40 critical vulnerabilities and completely exhaust the whole live event budget. And this is before this hacking, you have two weeks before you even go on site to do some of this hacking. So the budget get, gets exhausted, like we saw in previous slides, before the live event really even happens. And then you fly all these hackers out there, and then the customers are nickel and diming the hackers, downgrading their reports, out of scoping their reports, combining them with other reports really unfairly because they basically have no budget left for the project. Um, and it's kind of the fault in this case of both, you know, the expectations of the clients, the you know, non-understanding of the scope, um, and non-understanding about how effective live events are at finding vulnerabilities. Okay. So there was a panel earlier this week at the Bug Bounty Village. There's a Bug Bounty Village here, if you didn't know. And the panel was some of my closest friends um, on this panel. And so I don't want to like crap on them, really. But they said something that really pissed me off. So basically, I'm paraphrasing here. But they said, like, going public or tweeting or making the platform's job harder in any way will make them not want to work with you and not get invited to programs which I think is a bunch of bullshit because we are the product. All you have, if you are a platform, is a goddamn web page. You don't have any way of finding vulnerabilities. The hackers are the product. And so if you think that sharing data between platforms and stuff is right and like kind of blackballing researchers, uh, you have grossly uh, not oriented kind of your whole company the right way. Your hackers are the only thing you really have. Uh, otherwise you're a glorified ticketing system. Um, now, this happens because platform triage gets burnt out. They handle hundreds of thousands of bugs a week. Um, I mean, I've, I've managed these teams, but it is, a core, uh, it is a core need for that team to be the stalwart defenders of the hackers. The triage team at the platform needs to make sure at every opportunity the hackers are treated like rock stars and they are stood up for. Because if any time that any of these hackers decides to not work on the program, they have nothing to sell. Um, and so this paraphrase here of those leaders at those companies really made me mad, even though I knew them. Um, and so this goes back to the idea that the hackers are the product and they're being kind of mistreated in a lot of ways um, on some programs, not all. The worst scenario of all time that's happened at least once documented was that internal triagers at a platform stole research from a bug hunter and then resubmitted it to other bug bounty programs in their own name. Um, so this has happened at least once that we know of, um, and uh, it is absolutely atrocious. And so it caused a kickoff of uh, basically a whole bunch of process at this place where this happened. And so um, I would like to say that I, you know, I thought that that was the only instance that ever happened was the one that got caught and publicized, um, but I don't think it is. I think that um, triage jobs, um, they, uh, you know, basically those people get to see all the research and, you know, they should be held to a very high ethical standard for keeping that vulnerability uh, data uh, private, so. All right. So another thing that happens in the bug bounty industry that's kind of crappy is celebrity, and I'm guilty of this. So I am an InfoSec celebrity. I have 160,000 Twitter followers. I connect with everybody on LinkedIn, but I earned it. I have been doing work and research for 20 years. 
Um, and a lot of the big bug hunters earn it. But what it does is it creates a power disparity with newer bug hunters who don't have that celebrity. So let me give you some examples of the advantages celebrity gives you in bug bounty. Um, big names get big service. So for instance, if I submit a bug, uh, I know Casey Ellis. Uh, he is the CTO of Bug Crowd. I worked with him for five years at Bug Crowd. If I think I'm being treated unfairly, if I really want to go out of my way, I can DM him and be like, yo, why are you guys being stupid? This is a good bug. I'm submitting it. Talk to the triage team. Um, and so a lot of big name bug hunters have this power. They know internal employees. Some of them at the platforms get their own CS reps. So they get a, a, an actual CS rep assigned to them to help them get their bugs pushed through faster. Um, so they'll get out of band or instant support. And basically what it means is that these people have like an unfair power dynamic to somebody who's just coming up in which they earn some, but I still think there's a system in where no name people who don't have any rep or any research to their name, but find really, really good bucks, which is the spirit of bug bounty. Anybody can find a bug. I mean, there was, there was this guy one time who had never done bug bounty. He was a developer. I was working on the platform. Um, and, uh, He's now a very famous bug bounty hunter, but he started off as a developer and he found uh, the most amazing SSO misconfiguration I've ever seen. Completely wrecked this program by basically being able to log in as anyone in their whole SSO um, kind of staple, anyone in the company. And, um, and that's the kind of bugs you want. You want people coming out of the blue and just finding amazing stuff. Um, but sometimes it doesn't happen like that because nobody knows who they are. So there should be a better system for this. Other things that really suck about the process is that after, um, after you have a couple rounds of conversation with the platform, really it's done. The door is closed, right? Like if you have two comments on a submission and you disagree with the rating or anything happens, there's no more recourse for you. They just shut you down. Like that's it. You, you can comment 50 more times and they can see it in the back end. They get alerts, but they just won't reply to you. So at some point there's really no recourse for bug hunters when they think that they've been treated unfairly. I uh, five minutes, right? Okay, so I'm gonna roll through this. Um, the worst form of uh, bug bounty runner is somebody who does a public VDP to get free bugs and then runs a private paid program um, to basically funnel people into. It's basically farming free work from bug hunters. So that kind of sucks for um, the community in general. Um, let's see here. Some other shitty things are uh, the platforms treat hackers as the product in more than just uh, the hacking ways. They also um, have in several instances, like use them as marketing tools, um, as mini celebrities, and they very rarely pay them for that work or, um, or anything like that. Okay, some tips and tricks if you are a bounty hunter. Some of you did raise your hand, I think like maybe 20 of you. Um, so if you wanna engage in debating criticality, one of my tips is pre-provide your justification in CVS 4.0 uh, in the original submission. So don't let them make the mistake, right? Uh, Pre-write it out. Here is why this is access level this. Here is why privileges required are this. Um, if you want your bug to get triaged uh, with high impact, also do some research on what compliance they may be subject to and reference that the bug might cause them to be out of compliance with X, Y, and Z and then write out your impact scenario in your bug really, really well. Scare the shit out of them if you can. Use ChatGPT if you have to do it, but um, do this and you will get paid more consistently. Uh, if you have a bug that is in a multi-use platform, um, don't submit it to everything all at once. Submit it to one program, get it paid, wait for a little bit and then submit it to another program and then wait for a little bit and then submit it for to another program to make sure that they're not doing anything nefarious but like sharing your attack strings among their customers and just kind of visit uh, and just kind of make sure that um, uh, you can stagger your bug. A lot of times what customers will do is they'll say, oh, um, we're gonna make one fix and it'll fix all these things if you shoot a uh, vulnerability class at them. Um, so if you stagger your reports, and then they give you that answer, or they, if you stagger your reports, they'll fix the one bug, and then you can wait a little while and send another one. And then eventually if they say, hey, we're gonna do one fix for all of this, um, then you can test after that too. And then revisit all your old bugs for bypasses as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, some tips, if you uh, wanna kinda go out of scope every once in a while, or you find something that you think is out of scope, 
I have used a submission um, just to ask the client a question, which puts the bug bounty platform in a little bit of a weird way. I don't care, it doesn't hurt my submission score a lot, but like here's an example. So for State Farm, they didn't have um, creds on GitHub um, in their scope. And so I just burned a submission. I said, hey, I think I found like 20 creds of your people in, um, in GitHub. Do, do you want me to submit this? And so then the, the triage team has to forward it to the customer and they have to answer it honestly. Now it has to be worded carefully because otherwise that could seem like extortion. And I'm gonna give them the bugs anyway. That's what I'm gonna do. If they say no, I'm gonna be like, cool, sucks you don't take it, here's 20 things. So I'm never on the edge of extortion, but at least they see it and have the opportunity to say, okay, yeah, this is cool. We'll pay this guy. That's a tip there. Um, when push comes to shove at the end, um, when you are locked out, you can't make any more comments, you've done all kinds of escalations on the platforms, the customer is not agreeing with you, but you still have a good bug. Um, well, then you can ask for disclosure or you can just YOLO disclose the bug uh, via a blog post or Twitter. Um, and so this happens often when companies out of scope or NA a bug, uh, not applicable, uh, not applicable a bug. Um, and so if they think it's out of scope or not applicable or no security impact, these are all the three ways they can rate it, then by contract, I actually don't have the right to blog about it um, on the platforms. As soon as I press the submit button for a vulnerability on a platform, it belongs to the platform, that data. And that is the contract I have to sign. But I think that we should have the right as bug bounty hunters to disclose if someone says it's out of scope or they don't care about it. We should be able to write about it. We spent time researching it and trying to help them. Um, and so I hope that changes over the years. Closing thoughts. Um, platforms are nothing without their product, the hackers. Um, heavy education needs to happen to clients on, the, on what kind of the core of the bug bounty contract is. Better communication needs to improve on all platform features and every function of a bug bounty in the triage cycle and in the scope creation cycle needs to be documented just like source code is, just like you can review a revision history to keep everybody honest. That's it.